question. You guys are going to be answering questions. Okay. So, yeah, so I Chris, thank you very much. Um, if I may, I'm just going to reiterate what Margaret said are the ground rules, just, just so we all know them. Um, for the section here that are Town of Colesville residents, we're going to have the questions now, and you're welcome to raise your hand. I'll point so that we have some order as to who's going to ask the question. And we'll hand the mic to you. And one reason we want to do that is so that everybody can hear the question, and hopefully our two speakers, whatever the question is directed to them, they'll repeat the question so that we can all hear it. Uh, what we'd like to do is one question per person. I know that's going to be difficult. It's going to want to be more of a dialogue or a debate, but if we could try to stick with the rule of a single question so that everybody gets to ask a question and get an answer to it, hopefully. Uh, and then um, as we go through that, if, if everybody's had an opportunity to ask a question and there's still people that want to ask a question, by all means, in the center section, we'll go back around to people that have already asked the question so that we work our way all the way through that. Um, the tendency is going to be, I know, to have somebody who then wants to chime in as they hear either the answer from the speaker or the question. And, and we're just going to have to ask you to be patient and we'll go through the questions the way we have it as, as our parameters. Um, I'm the town attorney in a number of different towns, and one of the reasons I enjoy the town of Colesville board meetings and the way they do things and the residents is everybody here is very respectful, no matter what the issue is. And I don't expect that it'll be any different tonight. And so if you would, just if we could just follow those rules, let somebody speak, even if you completely disagree with the question or the point that's being made or what the speaker has to say, Please just let them do it. You'll get your turn to ask the question and make your point. Uh, but if we could follow those rules, that would be much appreciated. After those questions, then, as Margaret said, we're going to have a separate uh, scenario where somebody can come up to the podium and speak for up to two minutes. But for now, it's the questions. Um, if you would, when you get the, you raise your hand, I'll point to you. If you'd stand up, use the mic, uh, and ask the question to the particular speaker, uh, that'd be appreciated. Thanks. Yes, gentleman back here. I'm Paul LeBlanc. I live here in Colesville. Does it work? I think so. Can you hear me? My, my question is about the water that's necessary to really both speakers, necessary to be used to actually because I understand it's, it comes to millions and millions of gallons when you add up the wells. And, you know, when I drive by the Shenango River and I'm looking at rocks, I'm wondering where we're going to get the water from. And then I just read about the drought in Texas. And in Texas, the, 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 they had to limit water use because of their severe drought. So they limited residential water use. Then they limited commercial water use. Then they limited agricultural water use. The last restriction made on water use was for the fracking process there. So I guess it's a two-part question. The first part is, you know, I've heard, I've read in the paper analysis about the average flow in our rivers, and we have more than enough, but I know that's an average. And it's not uncommon for me to drive down 88 and look at the Shenango River and see a lot of rocks. And I'm thinking, we're going to start pumping millions of gallons. Where does the water come from, aside from the problems of it after it's used? So that's, how do you see that playing out in our area uh, if that were to happen? So that's my question. Thank you. Sure, I, I appreciate you. I'll start. I'll start, and then this thing working again? It might be off. No? OK, I'll start. And, and uh, one of the things I said before is, is that and I said this as I've worked as an uh, environmental consultant all over the place, and one of the things that happens that people don't actually realize, nobody actually realizes, that you actually think that the water that's on your property and stuff like that, you're actually in control of. But in reality, the water that, that's on our property, that's in our ponds, that's flowing through the little streams and our thing, is actually regulated by the Susquehanna River Basin Commission. The Susquehanna River Basin Commission, like, if you wanted to sell the water in your pond, to a gas company to do hydrofracking with? No. You've got to get a permit to do that. 
you have to get a permit to do anything from the Susquehanna, from the Susquehanna River Basin Commission. And they regulate it fairly well. And they know what the flow is. And if the flow gets low, like you say, they stop it. They stop it. If the flow will not sustain the river and, apply, and, and allow for the people who actually have permits, towns, cities, golf courses, farms, whatever, to get water, there's no water withdrawn for right right. It stops. It stops right there. Just, just that quick. And then, if it comes back up, it does. And the other thing that always comes up, and DEC is involved in this, is they're, they're on top of maintaining enough water in the stream to maintain the habitat for those creatures. So somebody's on top of that. I, I can remember when I was a county legislator and we were in a drought period and the uh, uh, all of a sudden, I was getting loads of phone calls. Uh, people's wells were going dry, and saying, "What gives?" And there was this guy who uh, had a pond, and he was filling his pond with the with from his well. Uh, you know, I I, I I love Bob's optimism, <laughs> but uh, the the fact of the matter is. Uh, I, I don't know of too much fracking activity that stops when uh, uh, when, when things uh, when we get into drought periods. Certainly, uh, at, there are times when we have more than enough water than we <coughs> like to deal with, right? But there are certainly other times when uh, uh, we can use all that we can get, and the um, and water is our most precious natural resource. It really is. We're, we're blessed in this state with a lot of water. And uh, to frivolously, uh, to me, you know, there's a big difference. And this is another thing I hear from the gas companies. Oh, well, we're not going to use any more than it takes to uh, uh, water a golf course. Uh, totally, well, they know the difference. Uh, this is water uh, in a golf course. It stays within the water cycle. The water that's uh, frac, it's used in fracking, that's, like I said, purposely contaminated, and it basically takes that water out of the water cycle. So that's the difference. Yes, the gentleman here. Thank you. Uh, Matt Kukas, uh, Pierce Pound Road, town of Colesville. Um, uh, Bob, you're, since you're a resident of the area, and obviously you read the Bingham Press and Sun Bulletin, uh, and you saw the copy in this morning's paper regarding. Uh, well, I was actually dealing with my mother. Oh well, there's a there's a copy in the back of the room. We can we can get one for you, but it, it dealt with the issue of uh, the inability of New York State to currently regulate and inspect sufficiently the number of wells that are currently involved in New York State, and you mentioned the number. 9,000 wells within this five county district that uh, they're planning on initiating fracking activity in. Uh, can you please respond to that in terms of the ability of New York State to control the inspection and regulatory process? I can, and, I, and I'll respond to you. Like I said before in the beginning, I happen to be on the advisory panel, the governor's advisory panel on this, and we talk. you talk about the five county thing, and I'll, I'll tell you that uh, over a year ago, this is, not, this is not anything that's been new to me. Over a year ago, the DEC was looking at the same area as the best potential for natural gas development. The reason they were looking for it is really quite simple. If you go a few miles south of us into Pennsylvania, the production down there is very good. So you come across the border up to here, and they're expecting it to be good, and they're expecting that, not the, that the agencies, not the agencies, but the companies that are interested in it will come to the areas that they think are best. And that just, that just makes common sense. However, to get to your specific question, is the DEC's projections were 50 wells the first year that they issued permits. Now, the DEC can certainly regulate 50 wells. The second, the second year, they're expecting a little over 100. The third year, about 225. The fourth year, about 300 and some. And the fifth year, they might get up to 1,000. Now, the interesting thing is, and one of the things that, remember before I talked about the number of wells on the well pad, when I say, 50 wells the first year, and then I say over 100 the second year, that isn't more well pads necessarily. That's more, they're going to drill more wells on those same pads because you have to complete them within three years. So we're talking about 
sending DEC personnel out to the different areas. And one of the things that landowners have always been really straightforward with the DEC on is we want to be sure you have enough personnel to do this. And we want to be sure you have enough money. And, and the other thing we talk about on the advisory panel frequently is we talk about where is the funding coming from for to put on this additional personnel. <laughs> well, I can give you a quick, a quick local rundown where I think some of the money should come from. Uh, the town of Sanford. The town of Sanford uh, in 2008 leased out 50,000 acres at $2,411, which is over $120 million if you add it up. It's $124 million. Well, they paid $8 million plus in income tax on that. Nothing's been done with that money. I mean, that's in the state coffers someplace. And I can go right down through just areas around here where, where groups of people have leased land. And in Broome County, in, in Tioga County, I can come up with over $12 million that's already given to the state. So to me, the state says, where are we going to get the money to put the additional personnel on? I tell you, they're going to, they should be able to get the money from income tax that's being paid by the landowners who have, who have leased or are going to lease the land. And they should be able to get it to the income tax you're going to pay on the royalties which is going to be 10 times as much as the income tax paid on the lease. I, I think this is an area where uh, the land, many of the landowner groups and environmentalists uh, uh, agree upon, that uh, we, uh, if we don't have regulation, we're in, in, in deep trouble, uh, and inspection. So uh, I, I think this is a common ground that we can come together on. Uh, I will say, uh, uh, well, I guess a couple of observations. Certainly, you know, when, when they talk about economic development, and actually Bob uh, identified, you know, you know, this money that comes in the taxes, uh, you'll be lucky if it covers the costs at, at the end of the day. So this is not additional money. Unlike a lot of other industry that, uh, that this, uh, it doesn't take a rocket science to understand how this would negatively affect other sectors of our economy, which is something I never got to in my talk, but I, I'll use the opportunity here. Uh, the, um, even the DEC admits that this will negatively affect other sectors of our economy. So they don't, they don't quantify that, which is what you wish they would. Uh, but, um, and, and most other sectors, uh, you know, pay their taxes uh, without a lot of expense to the, uh, to the community, whereas this, uh, this particular activity brings a lot of expenses along with it. Expenses to the community. Um, back here, I think you had your hand off first. I'm Chuck Hendrickson. I live in Parkview in uh, Colesville. Um, hi, Chris. Hey, Bob. Um, my question is, uh, what's the contingency plan? I mean, I, I, I bought my piece of property and built myself a nice little place out in the woods where it's nice and quiet and peaceful. And now they're going to put a drill, uh, expect to put a drill well next to my house. Now, I've been on many of these sites, as you know, Chris, and I've set up a lot of these uh, drill wells and rigs and so I know exactly what's all going to happen. So what's the contingency plan on, uh, on my own, my standard of living and the house that I provided for my family and the, uh, the lifestyle that I prefer to live in? I mean, there's going to be noise, there's going to be the uh, truck traffic, there's going to be you know, devastation throughout the wildlife that we have around the house. Contingency plan. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, the, there, there is no... Uh, there is no contingency plan. That's the problem. Uh, the, the the issue is, uh, you know, certainly if you have a lot of acres, uh, and, and I've heard, you know, I've gotten into conversations with uh, some people who basically, you know, they own a lot of land, and they they say, you know, I'd be crazy not to take this deal. If something goes wrong, uh, I could pick up and and move to another place. And, well, that's their contingency plan, uh, but. Um, but for a community, that's a little difficult, isn't it? So, uh, and again, if you're a smaller landowner where all your equity is locked into your home, then, uh, and, and you're not gonna get much from, from this. 
So that, that's why a lot of people have a tough time with this issue. Um, the, um, so, yeah, I guess I'll leave it there. Yeah, I think you had your hand up. Blue shirt. Gordon Carroll, Goldsville Road. You've made several assertions this evening that there's nothing but negative economic benefit that stems from this. Um, we have a model that's been working. No, the gentleman in the in the sweater. You have a model that's been working, if not under a microscope, for four plus years in Pennsylvania. I happen to know numerous people that live there. I know three people that have a pad on their property. And, and done much investigation myself. I can give you numbers just like you can spit them out on the economic benefit in Montrose, even, even the nonprofits. Go ask the Montrose Library, all these things. But how can you stand there and say that land depreciation, property depreciation, attempt to buy property, attempt to buy a home in Pennsylvania, and you're standing there telling me that there's all these depreciations and all these negativity. Where are you coming up with these figures? Well, first of all, uh, I, I didn't say it was all negative. But my, my big beef is, uh, especially with the computer models that the industry tends to roll out, is they don't look at the, the negative at all. So you only see the positive, you don't see the negative. And I'm saying there are negatives. Uh, that 22% depreciation wasn't my figure. That came directly out of the SKIS, the uh, uh, Environmental Impact Statement. Well, and, and from, uh, from uh, people who live down in PA. If you go down in PA and talk to people, please take the industry tour. Definitely take the industry tour. But then talk to real, real people and see if it's a pretty picture from their standpoint. I have a couple things to add to it, and I actually cheated because I actually went to a presentation that uh, Chris gave last night and saw the things he was going to say. So based on, based on what he did last night, I actually made a bunch of phone calls today. <clears throat> one of the things, one of the things that, that he says is that you can't get a mortgage. I called three banks. I called Tioga Savings. I called People's Bank. I, well, actually, four. I called uh, Tioga, People's, Shimon Canal, and m and I called those banks today, and I talked to, I talked to either the uh, vice president or someone who was in charge of uh, investing. And I asked him questions about getting mortgages, and none of these, the people, especially the people at Peoples were the most forthcoming with, they said, we don't have a problem with giving a mortgage out on a piece of property that has a gas lease on it, as long as we're first on that mortgage. But I bought property before, and I think many of you have before too, and the banks always claim, want to be first. And they always want, and, and with a, if you have a lease on it, they might want the lease tied up as future collateral too. But as long as they're in that position. Now, the problem might, if you had, the problem with getting a lease might come if you already have leased your property. You already have a lease on it with a gas company. And you want to refinance it or you want to sell it to someone else and they come and get a mortgage and the gas company refuses to take the second position. That could be the problem. And that's, that's a real possibility. But if everything is the way that it's supposed to be, mortgages aren't a problem. The other thing I asked the fellow in the investment is about property values in Pennsylvania. He said, well, let me tell you what I know about property values in Pennsylvania. He said, it used to be that you could come down here and buy, buy almost any piece of land for $800 to $1,200 an acre. He said, now you're talking, if you can buy it for ten dollars to $12,000 an acre, you'd be lucky, if you can find it. That's, that, that's not my words. It was Bill Lewis, People's Bank. You can call him yourself. Lady down here. Hello, I'm Linda Dumbelevich, and I have a I have an organic vegetable farm in in Harpersville, a town of Harpersville. Uh, here here's my issue: if my next door neighbor has a well, and that well are a, a gas well, and it pollutes my water well, who do I sue? The gas company or my neighbor? That's a good question. The, uh, it's a real good question. The, uh, the situation you're going to have, and this would come into this would be coming into liability and uh, and insurance requirements and stuff like that. And I'm going to tell you right now, I am not a liability lawyer at all. I'm an environmental guy, 
but I actually made some, some questions on this. And, I, and, I, and actually, I'm going to go back to one of the, I'm going to just digress just a minute. One of the things that Chris was talking about before was compulsory integration. And there's some issues in compulsory integration. And I'm going to talk just a very brief part about the liability issues associated with compulsory integration. If you're forced into compulsory integration like, because somebody else has 60% of the land and, and you contribute it because they have to take your land and make it the size of the drilling unit, if you're forced into compulsory integration, you basically have three choices. You have three choices under compulsory integration. One is to take the royalty interest. That means you don't do anything. You just get royalties on the gas based on your acreage percentage in the whole unit. That's it. If that happens, nothing happens on the surface. If they can't drill there, no liability. You have no liability if you take the royalty interest. Now, there are two other choices. One of the other choices is becoming a, a non-participating owner. And if you decide to become a non-participating owner, you don't get any royalties or anything until you've actually paid back 300% of the cost of drilling the well. Okay, you've got to pay back 300%. At that particular time, you're an owner of the gas thing, and you're going to get 100% interest. And, a lot of, and some people will take that, that uh, non-participating ownership because they know in the future they'll get more royalties. However, there's a very good chance under this scenario that once you've paid your 300% back, that you have exactly the same liability as the gas company. So in that case, your neighbor, you could sue him and the gas company because they're actually one and the same. The, and the third choice, of course, is being a participating owner. If you're a participating owner, you start right off the bat when you're compulsory integrating, you tell the gas company, I want to be a participating owner, and the gas company will say, okay, it's going to cost us a million bucks to do this. You own one-fifth of the land, pony up $200,000. And you give them $200,000, and right from day one, you are participating on it. You are, in fact, part of the gas company then. So, yeah, you'll have liability then, no question about it. No question at all about it. But your neighbor who has the gas well on his property, he, he should have a really good lease because his, he, should need, he needs a lease like the landowners put together that describe liability and who's actually liable in there. You can sue anybody that you want to in the United States. That's just our way of doing business. We sue anybody you want to. But if you have a good lease with the gas company, a good lease written by a good attorney, that uh, then you'll direct the liability to them. That doesn't mean you can't be sued, but the gas company will be responsible answer that a couple of different ways, I guess. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm not an attorney either. We, we should have had Alan. We should have had Alan. Alan, Alan right. into this question. But uh, uh, you got me. Uh, so uh, here's the deal with liability. It's, it's my understanding if you sign a lease, you're party to, the, uh, to, to what happens there. And, and, and under that scenario, uh, you are technically liable. Now, of course, and that's even... Obviously, it's the gas company and the gas operation that actually caused the problem, right? Uh, but it, by the, the history of the industry is anything happens, uh, oh, it wasn't our fault, right? Uh, we see this time and time again. And, and their, their lawyers probably tell them to say that, actually. Uh, uh, but um, but at, so at, at the end of the day, uh, the, the landowner who has uh, entered into the lease, uh, I, I think, actually has more exposure simply because they don't have a lot of lawyers uh, to back them up as much as the, uh, uh, the gas industry. Now, the other way I tackle that, uh, that question is the fact, okay, so you're, you've, you, you have uh, uh, land, you, you have an occupation, that's your livelihood, that has now been uh, destroyed, basically. And, and so... Okay, you can turn to your the neighbor who was a party and, and uh, that brought this, uh, that enabled this to come in, uh, and, and certainly they should be held accountable to that to a certain extent. But uh, but the gas company between the two parties, you you're not going to have a lot to go after. Uh, the, the the companies will fight you tooth and nail. It, it's going to be tough for you to get restitution, and, and, and even for the and I'll take the opportunity to uh, speak a little bit to the, uh, to the leases themselves, because I know a lot of landowners think that, oh, I'm just going to get a tight lease and uh, get protected. But there again, I would submit anyway, that at the end of the day, you know, something goes wrong, you as a landowner, even 
you as a landowner who signed the lease wants to get that fixed, right? So you turn to the uh, gas company, who was your friend when they came in, right? Uh, but at that point, they're the enemy. And, and again, the, the, the track record on the, uh, the industry is deny, deny, deny. And if, if you get any satisfaction on that, that you could have the tightest lease in the world, and at the end of the day, you're going to have to go to court. And in court, you're outgunned. Even if you're part of a, a landowner group, you're outgunned. Uh, you know, I, I, I hearken back to the example of the uh, fishing industry up in Alaska who 20, 20 more years, uh, it's been more than 20 years since the Exxon Valdez, we all remember that. They're still waiting for restitution on the damages that the uh, industry inflicted on their livelihood. And, and, they, and they, uh, they had to take them to court because you know, gas companies are saying, no, it's, uh, we're not liable. But, uh, and they won every battle, court battle, but of course, the, the other thing that the industry has is the uh, appeal process that can be dragged on forever. And of course, this is the other thing with uh, like the, uh, when we start treating uh, companies and corporations like people, you and I have a limited lifetime. They, have unlim they can draw this out forever. It's very rare that people get completely uh, satisfied in these types of uh, court battles. John Armstrong, Maritown Road. Uh, Mr. Berger, you seem to suggest that uh, through eminent domain, the gas companies would be allowed to run gathering lines across our land. Would you answer that, please? If, if that is in fact uh, what you're saying. It, yeah, uh, it's my understanding that the, where's the, the the drill pads themselves uh, are obviously, uh, they come under DEC regulations. The, the gathering lines come under uh, the Public Service Commission, and they have powers of eminent domain. However, however, they, there's always a however. however there's a however to this one definitely, and, and this, was, this played out in uh, the laser pipeline when we did our negotiations with the laser pipeline, the Windsor, the Windsor Landowners Group. The Public Service Commission does have powers of eminent domain under extreme circumstances. They don't like to exercise it. So if someone comes to you and they want to run a gathering line across your property, you can just say no. You can, if they, if they, they won't do it and the Public Service Commission won't grant them eminent domain. They don't do it. They, to the best of my knowledge, they've never done it. So they just don't, it's not that they don't have the power, they just don't do it. They say, go back and talk to the landowners and work out your problem. Now, that's that. That's the gathering. If we go to a FERC project, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, and it's a, a big project like the Millennium Pipeline or something like that, they definitely have the power of eminent domain. And the public, and the difference between, the difference between the state regulations and the federal regulations are really quite simple but it's very complex. The Federal Energy Regulatory Commission has a procedure and they have a schedule. They, they start off with it with the, somebody comes in and does a pre-filing thing and talks to the Public Service Commission then they go to the pre-filing, they start making maps and putting the pipelines through and then they write the resource reports but everything's on schedule and they're dealing with the landowners the whole time. If they get to a point and they can't get across my land or Chris's land or your land or your land the Public Service Commission allows the use of eminent domain, and it is not for gathering lines. The Public Service Commission is prohibited by Congress to regulate gathering lines. That's a fact. Anybody in the middle section? I belong in the middle section. I am in the middle section. Uh, I am. Yeah. 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 Over here, this fellow over here. <laughs> No, he, he actually had his hand up. If you're in the town of Poles, well. How's that? I'll be just more looking at the outside. No, that's all right. Don't worry about it. Hi, uh, Jason Bruno, 22 Parkway Drive. I apologize if you didn't sit in the middle section. Um, I, I have a quick, I guess I guess I'd pose this to both speakers. I, I've got several points I'd like to make, um, but I'll make one now. Uh, the first thing is, what is the big deal with waiting two or three years, given that 
the gas price is low. Um, I, I don't think anyone would disagree that the issue is still controversial. There's still problems with hyd the hydrofracking process. There's still problems with the leases. There's problems with everything. And the more time that we spend or, or allowing Pennsylvania, let's say the situation in Pennsylvania to rear its head, what is the big deal with waiting a couple more years? Um, I would just say as a minimum until the, the wellhead price goes back up again and at least everyone can make more money. Okay, let me take a crack at this and then I'll throw it to, to Chris. The problem, the problem with waiting a couple of years isn't necessarily a problem of waiting a couple of years. They actually want to wait at four. We right. started from four. And I, can, I, have, I have on my desk pinned up the uh, DEC's original <coughs> schedule to prepare this. Started in the fall and... Hey, was, I, just, I don't care how many wait years. I can care, I can care less wait a hundred years, okay? Are, are you asking a question now or are you making a comment? No, I'm making a comment. I don't no, care how many years we're waiting. Let's follow the rules. Yeah, okay. yeah so I, he didn't answer. I, he, he spun it. Right? He's breaking the rules. I'm, at, I'm asking. No, I'm not. Well, maybe I'll change the rules. But I'm just saying, just let's start over from here. So we're going to follow the rules or you'll leave. One or the other. <laughs> we're going to follow the rules. They're going to answer. Thank you. Okay, back to what I was saying. Back to what I was saying. Is a lot, if there's, we've gone four years with, through this process now, which is okay. It's not, it's not bad. Stuff is better now than it was then. And some of the, one of the things that a lot of people don't understand is that if you go around the world, the best environmental regulations in the entire world are in the United States. And I'm a, I'm a guy who believes in environmental regulations. They're in the United States, the best environmental regulations. And in the United States, the best environmental regulations are in New York State. The people in California might argue that point, but I believe they're in New York State. And one of the things that I know, I've done this for 40 years, and one of the things that I know for sure, if somebody starts a process, I don't care what it is, it could be, it could be commercial fishing, it could be hydrofracking. If a problem cop, crops up, the regulations are going to change instantly. They're going to stop giving well permits, and the regulations change instantly. People think that once this process is done and they, they release this document, that it's all over. It's not. They're going to continue looking at it, and if something happens, it'll, they'll change it. They change regulations. Regulations change all the time. It's true that the New York State has uh, the best environmental regulations in the world on some things, but not everything. And I would submit that it's uh, not quite up to snuff in, in this case on gas drilling. Having said that, none of us know at the end of the day what this uh, document is going to look like. We, we, we hope. We, uh, uh, we have a lot of hopes. And that's why I actually advise uh, towns, you know, uh, you know, you hope for the best, but plan for the worst. I think the, um, I, would, I would say the vast majority of uh, people in New York State want science to decide this. On both sides uh, of this issue, they want science to decide this. Um, and, uh, you know, I think I, I, I'm not naive. I know I would imagine some of those people uh, say that because they think science is going to, uh, uh, to justify their preconceived notions. Uh, but uh, but I'll, take, uh, I'll take the support anywhere I get it. And we certainly have a governor now that's saying that he wants science to decide this. Having said that, I know people on both sides of the coin that are very fearful that this is going to be a political decision. Uh, now, of course, the uh, pro-gas drillers, uh, they're fearful that uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the other side has uh, overwhelming numbers to push the, uh, the, the politicians in, in their direction. Uh, the, and, and, they, and they have good, uh, good reason to fear that. It, it seems like, uh, you know, the, the longer this stretches out, more and people more and more people are, are against gas drilling. I don't know, actually, quite frankly, too many people that gas drilling looks better the more they look at it. Uh, but, uh, so, having said that, uh, the, the other side, of course, uh, is fearful that, uh, the, the anti-drilling side is fearful that, you know, they're dealing with an industry with more money than God, and that money is going to uh, determine this. Uh, 
so I think both sides have, uh, have good reasons to, uh, to take the stand they are. Having said that, again, getting back to the original question of, uh, uh, you know, I, one of the things that have kind of undermined people's uh, uh, trust in DEC, there's a number of things, but uh, one of the things was, uh, I can remember early on, uh, when the uh, previous governor basically said that, that he was going to let the process go, go through, but we, we know that uh, there were people, and, and I'm not going to name any names, uh, uh, but it was a former county executive, uh, <laughs> but, uh, and, and other people were, went up there and, um, and, and pressured the, the governor, and he uh, then all of a sudden they issued a, a memo saying, you will get the S guys out by set, a draft out by such and such a date. I don't know, uh, I don't know any science that follows those uh, uh, predetermined, uh, that predetermined timeline. Uh, the, the, when Cuomo came in, he was basically saying the same thing, yet, uh, uh, you know, it wasn't even a year into his, uh, his, his, uh, his term when he issued basically uh, the same type of memo. So the other thing that we've uh, noticed is a lot of us uh, who are involved right from square one raised uh, some issues, some pretty, what we consider some pretty important issues that draft after draft still uh, haven't been addressed. The, uh, the uh, you know, I, I, I think there's a, there's a lot of good things in that document. I, most of the things that I, uh, I have in my presentation came from that document. So it's a, it's a good document as far as it goes, but there's still uh, a lot left undone. I come back to, you know, if a person's house is leaking and they require, they ask the uh, contractor to fix it, and, and then f uh, four years later he still hasn't fixed it, is it the, uh, is it the uh, homeowner's fault that uh, it isn't fixed, or is it the contractor's fault? And you had your hand up before. Hi, my name is Carol Martin, and I've lived in this town my entire life. <laughs> um, first of all, I'd like to say that this is a huge topic, and I hate the fact that it's going to be just quickly done over and goodbye tonight. I really would like to see us continue this dialogue and learn more about it, because they were absolutely rushed. They had each 20 minutes each. And there's an awful lot to learn, and there's a lot of things on both sides that we could all learn from. Secondly, um, you said that the, even the gas industry admits that 7.2% fail immediately, uh, gas wells. And then over the next 30 years, 60% of those gas wells fail. So what does that mean for the rest of us little peons that only have, you know, an acre of land and, um, we got to live with this threat for the next 60 years that maybe my water's going to go bad and the gas company's already packed up and moved on. And um, the big landowners made their money and they went to Florida. So who's going to protect me? And obviously I don't have any protection whatsoever right off the bat unless I have deep pockets like uh, the gas company because I can't sue them. I just have to, you know, suck up my loss and leave. Evidently. Yes, my risk. I, I don't want to try and that. Uh, well, the... What do you, what do, you do with that? Let Let's me start. Do yeah. I'll start and I'll give it to, back to Chris. The, uh, because we have different viewpoints on this. The, the slide that he gave on the industry stuff on gas, gas well failures and stuff like that, I'm going to make a suggestion, and it, it, it has to back to do with whether or not you trust what's going on with your own regulatory agency. I'm going to make a suggestion that you call either Brad Fields or Linda Collard in the Minerals Division and ask them what the failure rate of wells in New York State is. I'm telling you, New York State well, well for protection is different and it's an exercise different from forever. The, uh, the last time that they had a documented gas migration issue in New York State was in 
1996 in the town of Freeman. 1996 in the town of Freeman. And the DEC came in and required the gas company to repair that, and it was repaired within a week. So you need to actually talk to somebody about what's going on in New York State. I don't care. I actually, I live in New York State. I don't care what's going on in Colorado. Or I don't care what's going on. That's not true, I do. But I care more about what's going on here. Chris? Um, I've been to Bradford County, and I've seen all of those buffalo, water buffaloes next to beautiful homes. And they either have to sign a non-disclosure or they don't get any water for the rest of their lives. Is that fair? <clears throat> Jokingly, and it's not really anything to joke about, that uh, water buffaloes are the biggest growth in the street down, <laughs> down in TA. But, uh, no, okay, getting back to this, uh, he said, she said, um, the, uh, the figures that I was quoting uh, are both determined by uh, independent and industry, industry data. I don't think, I, I, I uh, respectfully disagree with Bob on, on this point that, uh, that you can't go back to uh, the track record in, in New York, even though I would suggest that even that is, uh, there's debate over that. Uh, but uh, even a bigger issue than that is, uh, this is a different animal than what we were doing. The, the, uh, the gas drilling that has occurred previously, uh, if you re recall what I mentioned earlier, uh, we used to get gas when we found pockets or reservoirs of gas and just drilled down and got it. Those are harder and harder to find. We, we are not talking about the same process here. So uh, to compare the track record of the, the gas drilling that has, uh, we don't have this type of gas drilling. That, that's what this whole debate is all about. We're, uh, so I, I don't think it's uh, kosher to compare. I don't think my question was Try to. Uh, gentleman here in the white hat had his hand up. Loud. Yeah, hi. Uh, I, uh, I have about 50 acres in the town of Colesville, and uh, I'm concerned about uh, my well, which is fine water coming out of it. And uh, what uh, what concerns me is that um, that we don't know, we don't have a sense of the power of these, um, and we say corporations, it's really individuals. I read uh, just a year or so ago that the IRS put out a, information that the 400 wealthy, not the 400 wealthiest, but the 400 top earners in the country average $344 million a year. That's like striking the lottery almost every day of the year at a million dollars a day. Now, those folks earn most, when I say earn, that's a whole questionable term, but those folks obtain that money mostly from investments. How much of their investments, those, those 400 top earners in the country, are invested in this stuff, and how powerful are they? That's the, that's the beginning of the question. The rest of the question is, we're going to get, let's say we go along with this, we're going to get, when I say we're, landowners, uh, the county, the, the villages and so on, are going to get so much money. How much are they going to get out of what we now own that belongs to us right now? How much are they going to get? Does anybody have that figure? We have figures on, you know, taxes and all this stuff and how much we're going to get. Where is the figure on what they're going to get? I don't think anybody knows uh, for sure. Uh, I, I know it's kind of a, a, a slippery deal. Uh, I, I know already, uh, like leases have been entered into, and those uh, and, and the landowner got a certain amount for that lease, and that lease has already been flipped. Uh, and, and so, does the landowner at that point get any more money? No. It's the uh, it's the uh, the guy who did the flipping. Uh, so. Uh, same with actually a gas out of the ground. Uh, when they when they calculate that, uh, they could calculate it on well, what's the going rate? But if they turn around, say they store that for a while and then and then sell it later on at a higher rate, does the uh, landowner get that uh, amount uh, uh, difference? No. So 
it, it's a it's a very slippery uh, deal uh, with uh, and and you're right. I mean, this is like David and Goliath, the uh, the industry versus uh, we're 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 stronger together than we are divided, and that's why I'm a strong supporter of uh, of landowner groups uh, because they sh I I tell anybody who. Uh, uh, that I present to, if you own land, join a landowner group. You're, you're more powerful together than, uh, than divided, but by the same token, even together, it's, it's a David and Goliath. And um, so. Let me, let me do somebody that hasn't asked a question before. Is there anybody, all three of you have asked before, so is there anybody else that hasn't? Yes, the lady up in the back. Um, my name is Sandra Johnson. I live on Pease Road in Harpersville. I want to know what is the purpose of having all of these TV stars, music stars, rock stars, whatever, coming out talking about fracking in our counties and our states. They don't live here. They don't have anything to do with this. And they're essentially. Yoko Ono's on the TV, she may live in New York City, but she's telling me what I can do with my property up here. I have a real problem with that. She's never lived here in my town. She doesn't drive my roads, but yet she's telling me what I should be doing. Now, a lot of these people have asked questions tonight. I don't think they've been answered correctly or answered at all. Um, I know this is a very passionate issue. I know there are people on both sides asking questions and they're asking about things that are very important. The environment is important. But when you're getting into the personal aspect, I think you're absolutely right. This needs to be a scientific answer. Everyone's opinions are not going to matter. And waiting, what's the point in waiting? You wait three years from now, we've waited four years, three years from now they're going to say, we need another study. We need another study. And then it's never going to happen. My question is, what, what is the purpose of having all of these people stepping forward, asking and talking about our area, and they don't live here? Okay. The consensus of the group up here, it's a quarter of public opinion. Uh, the, the gentleman... Um, yes, right there. He hasn't asked before. Yes. Hi, I'm Scott Colton. Uh, live at Loop 79 in Harpersville. Bob, Chris, I know you both well. Um, Chris, you stated this, this started out west with the frack, and it's come east. Have the controls of the regulations as it come east tightened up? If it started out in Wyoming and they had problems, if it came you know, further into the Midwest, did they tighten up again? You know, I think, I believe when it started in Pennsylvania, they had some issues. They tightened up the regulations. So, I guess that's my question. Since from the inception to like now, is it, it started out in the West and it's come East, have the regulations tightened up over the years? They, they most certainly have. And, and actually, that's why uh, BRISC, which is one uh, entity that I am a part of, uh, We've been approached, as you might imagine, many, many times to uh, support a ban, okay? And we have steadfastly refused to support a ban. And it basically rests precisely on, uh, I think, the, the premise of, of your question. Uh, to, to say that this could never be made safe, uh, I, I think is, uh, it, it's hard for us uh, to, uh, uh, to, to basically make that blanket statement. Now, having said that, uh, if you're asking me if I'm convinced at this juncture, with that, uh, with the, all those improvements uh, thus far, uh, I will say I'm not convinced yet. This is probably where Bob and I might disagree. I don't know, uh, but uh, uh, the but the other thing I think we should keep in mind is uh, I, I know the industry uh, gets painted as the bad guy. 
uh, a, a lot. But I, I think we should be have the integrity and honesty with ourselves to high, at least uh, uh, entertain the possibility that these guys are doing the best they can. Uh, and it may be that uh, the technology just isn't uh, up to snuff yet to, to deal with, the, with what they're trying to do with it. Uh, is that to say that it'll never be that, uh, uh, never be safe? No. Uh, but. Right, right. And, and I guess that's uh, another thing that it comes down to is how much risk are you willing to take? I, I, I see that uh, being played out in, in the debate too. Uh, some people are less risk tolerant than others. Uh, Scott, you're, you're, you're just a thing. Yes, the, he's right. The uh, the technology has improved and it's improved greatly. If you start out west and you go out west 10, 12, 15 years ago, you'll see drilling being done. You, when what they do is they used to bring the bring the uh, waste material up to, from the drilling process and they put it into pits. And we're we're not talking about lined pits. We're just talking about pits. And what it would do, it would just sit there until everything evaporated off. And the, when it got that, done evaporated... That was their answer to uh, right. the waste. And when it got evaporated off, and you could do this in dry climates. You could do this in a dry climate, evaporate it off. Then they'd come in with a bulldozer and they'd fill the pit in. Everything was, the pit was in, and everything that was in that waste in there was still a few feet underground or on top of the ground, whatever, wherever it was there. In the last four years, since, since it's come east and it's come... Uh, it, and even in Texas and down in Louisiana also, they've changed a great deal. I mean, it, their procedures got much, much, much better. And the, uh, one of the things that the landowners group has done, and, and, uh, and we'll take some credit for this, but we put together in the last, the last comment period after and you had to submit your, your comments in, instead of, instead of sending in uh, 10,000, or we, have, we estimate we have 70,000 people in our group, instead of seven, sending in 70,000 different comments, we sent one, one 28-page document that we got together, committee after committee after committee, and we said, what do we like? What don't we like in this document? And what do we think needs to be added? We sent a 28-page document in, which I hand-delivered to the DEC, and said, I got boxes of letters here signed. You don't have to look at them. This is it. Look at this one document. And we actually haven't, we don't know a lot the same thing as he does, because we haven't seen the final document yet. When the final document comes out, the landowners groups themselves will evaluate whether or not our suggestions are part of it or not. I mean, that's, and that'll be an increase. But yes, things have improved greatly, and we expect them to improve more. Seeing the same hands, is there anybody else that hasn't asked a question in the center section that, that wants to ask a question? Yes, the lady up in the back. This only, only because uh, one of the landowner groups that I work with is Tioga County, and they were actually <coughs> trying to bring this into New York State. And the gel process you use is gas frac, and it's uh, fracturing the rock with propane instead of fracturing with water. Uh, propane is kind of interesting, and it hasn't taken off in the industry for a couple of reasons. The primary reason is gas frac is a small company. They're a small company, and actually, in some areas, in some areas, it works good. Uh, I'm not sure how it works in the Marcellus because it has only limited uh, uh, testing here. But the advantage of it, from what I went to a seminar about gas frac, and the advantage to it, from what the gas frac people tell me, is first off, instead of having hundreds of trucks going in to, with the with the propane, you end up with about 30 trucks going in to do the fracturing. So that cuts back on the truck traffic. The other, the other thing that's kind of interesting about it is that 
when they gel the when they gel the propane and they put it into the ground, they actually have to put another thing in after it to ungel it. And the thing that they use to ungel it is sodium bicarbonate. And they put sodium bicarbonate in, and all of the propane comes back up with the natural gas, and there's no liquid coming up at all. It's just the propane. So they, that has some benefits, and it's still it's being studied. And one of the things that the, the SGIS asked for are alternative methods to do these kinds of things. And, and that this is one of the ones that I'm sure is, that will be evaluated. And it'll get used someplace. It'll get used someplace in New York or Pennsylvania, where, where it needs to be done. Just in a, a, a generic way, this is why I myself can't bring myself to say, let's ban uh, gas drilling outright, because you never know what's on the horizon. It could be just such a thing. Having said that, I mean, I, I could list some issues that, that uh, with gas, uh, gas fracking as well, but uh, uh, to say the jury is still out on that is uh, actually overstating it. The, the court hasn't even convened to, uh, to assess it yet. So, uh, it's something to, to keep on, an eye on. I will say, use the opportunity, though, to say, uh, and this, uh, this harkens back to uh, when the industry uh, for a long time has been saying, oh, we'll work, we'll, we'll come up with a, a clean frac fluid, okay? Uh, and, and my response to that was, uh, you could have the cleanest frac fluid in the world and that only solves half, half the problem. Uh, because what you're dealing with is not only the, the, the flow back from uh, the, uh, that has obviously uh, all the chemicals that you, well, not all the chemicals, that's one of the problems. Uh, they're only, they only have a small recovery rate uh, at this point in time. Hopefully it will improve, but we're, we're not experiencing that pre presently. But, uh, but bottom line is there's a lot of other stuff down there uh, that you've got to deal with no matter what naturally occurring stuff that you just as soon have it stay down there. But uh, the, uh, the, uh, the fracking, obviously designed to liberate gas, but it liberates a whole lot of other stuff. Yeah. Anybody else in the center section that hasn't asked a question yet? Yes, the gentleman here. In the... oh. I don't need, um, forgive me if I missed, uh, this was answered already, but how, how many gallons of water per well of fresh water is used for one well, approximate. Uh, uh, Bob is saying three to five. I've heard three to eight. Uh, a, a, a lot of water. Three to eight million gallons. Eight million gallons. So now, is that water with all our technology? Because I know the outer space people are doing their thing, but can they make that water fresh again? Well, that, that, that's a big debate. <laughs> Uh, number one, but number two, I, I keep on coming back to uh, ideally uh, in, in a closed loop process, you want a uh, hundred uh, percent recovery rate because then it's all right there, so you can deal with it as imperfectly as or perfectly as as you may. Uh, but the, the recovery rates that they're experiencing, maybe Bob knows different, but I'm hearing like uh, ten to twenty percent recovery rate. Uh, twenty. 20% recovery rate. So you can have 100% uh, uh, dealing with uh, the, the stuff that, you, you're, that comes up, but you still have 80% that's still down there. Um, well, um, let me speak to that, um, if, you, if you may. I'll, I'll speak to it if you want to just sit down for a second. We, we clearly have gone beyond the 9 o'clock, which was the, the deadline that Margaret talked about. Um, I was trying to make sure anybody that hadn't asked a question got an opportunity. Um, I'm not sure about the feeling if we can go to 9.15, do a few more questions of some that have a second question. But I really would like to make sure everybody that has a question that hasn't raised their hand before gets it. Have you asked before? I can't remember. Yes, then maybe you could ask um, your question and then we'll see where we stand. Um, the question that I had was, uh, you had mentioned earlier that uh, there were no cases of uh, water contamination uh, due to fracking. Um, yet in the, uh, there was an EPA study uh, from 1991 where they reported um, case after case um, in state after state of uh, groundwater contamination. 
uh, due to oil and gas extraction and also due to uh, water withdrawals, uh, mass water withdrawals. So I'm just wondering, is this just like semantics? Um, uh, you know, I mean, I hear this all the time, and yet there's government documents um, stating that, you know, whether it's drilling or fracking, I mean, you can't, you can't frack well without drilling it first. Um, the spills don't just happen, uh, you know, if you're not doing these, Like I said, you can't you can't frack well unless you drill it first. Whether it's the drilling or the fracking, or the spills that happen uh, as that from the brine that, that's coming up um, as a result. Either way, if you weren't doing the oil and gas drilling or frack fracking, this wouldn't be happening. And it's um, it's really a disgrace that uh, the people are being led to believe that there uh, this contamination is not happening. And you know, right up in uh, there there was the article that came out today, um, Walter Hanks article. Um, and also, uh, you know, I've talked to people up in uh, North Brookfield where they've had major problems with their water. And this happened uh, quite some time ago. The D.C. really did nothing to help them. They couldn't get a lawyer to take their case because they didn't have enough money um, to, to get the interest of any of the, any of the lawyers. Um, and I think, uh, you know, I, I just think it's really appalling that people are being led to believe that the D.C. is protecting us and that... Uh, it's just really is not the case, um, especially when we've, we've got. Uh, well, that right there, the, the question about the water. I, I mean, I just don't understand how you can say that there's no no case of contamination. I think the industry did a real disservice to the community and and really a disservice to themselves. And you you all remember back at the beginning of this oh. We've drilled a gazillion wells and haven't had a single problem. Um, and, and they know different. Uh, and, and I think you've kind of latched on one of the issues is the, the semantics, the tight semantics that they, they play uh, when, when, uh, in, in dealing with this. Uh, you know, people know this uh, generally as fracking and they understand it as, as the whole thing. Well, the industry sees it very differently. They see a, a very tight framework and if you can't prove that something happened within that very tight framework, well then, it, not, there's no problem with fracking. Uh, now, uh, I, I actually uh, saw a, uh, a presentation uh, given to the gas industry by their, uh, some PR people. Uh, and it was very interesting. They, they said, guys, you've got to stop doing this. Every time you say this, uh, your credibility just uh, goes down. Uh, a couple of notches. So, uh, and I think you've seen the industry. You know, there's some people that still haven't got the memo, and you'll still hear on occasion, "Oh, there's no problems." Uh, but uh, the the gas industry uh, uh, generally has moved away from that message, and, and that's why they're uh, because they know better. Yeah. Well, anyway, let me let me just address that just just briefly. Is that the gas, the gas and oil industry have had problems for years and years and years. If you go into East Texas, East Texas is a mess. And it has been for years. I mean, it's the oil industry too. It's a mess. But it's not a mess as a result of the process that we're talking about. Everybody labels hydrofracking as the issue. The issues, are, the issues are much simpler than that. But for years and years and years, one really can I don't know if you see some of these movies that are like, uh, remember Let There Be Blood, the movie Let There Be Blood? And they, and they show these oil wells come out, gushing oil all over the place, the oil would be gushing out for weeks before they were able to contain it. Well, that's the early part of the oil industry and the gas industry alike. They don't do that. But they did. I mean, they're not, that, that doesn't mean that at that time they weren't polluting oil and everything. But as Chris said before, things get better. Things change. And hopefully we can monitor we people. DEC, everybody can actually monitor to prevent some of that kind of stuff. That's why you have to have things in place. You must have things in place that are really good and well well structured, like the like I say, the things that the things that matter to me most because I've been on a zillion sites, are the stormwater plan, the spill containment plan. If those things are well developed and well staffed, then you'll you'll stop ninety percent of the problems. Will you stop every problem? No. Accidents will still happen, spills will still happen. Um, the consensus up here is that it would not be fair to try and pick and choose 
the number of hands that are having a second question, and we're really headed towards the 915. So some of you may have um, a quick question after we end, and I think we're going to have to end for tonight. Um, you're welcome to catch the speakers, but I think we have to be out of here at the last point of 930. So is that right, Margaret? So if you can catch the speakers, I know we didn't get through everything that we wanted to. Um, I want to thank everybody for the respectful attitude they had. It was, it was very good. As this lady said, we just didn't get through everything that we could. Uh, but again, thank you for, for your respect tonight. Will there be another meeting? The board will have to decide that.